ladies and gentlemen, welcome and, and thank you again. We're going to try to make up a little lost time, but I do think one preliminary is in order, and that is for the roughly uh, four or five hundred who uh, were, we were not able to accommodate initially in the other hall, I think you ought to give a round of applause to the gracious four or five hundred who said, sure, let's move down and let them in. <laughs> Um, uh, if anyone here is unaware of the credentials uh, of our uh, guest, uh, uh, the internet is available to you later. I'm not going to go <laughs> through them. I'll just, I'll just make this simple observation. I, I suppose, depending on one's viewpoint, someone could dispute that our guest is among the very finest of our nation's thinkers. I just don't know how anyone could dispute that he's among our finest writers. Uh, the Washington Journalism Review once uh, 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 deemed him finest writer any category. Now, what they meant was of the various categories they were honoring, he was first among equal, uh, equals. In the book of some, that some of us uh, pay, uh, would uh, uh, prefer, uh, he would uh, be the best writer on any subject he chooses. And uh, we've got a lot to choose from tonight in the questions that I'll ask and those that very shortly we'll invite uh, you to ask. Uh, let me just, uh, the obvious comments, please mute your cell phones and also yourselves uh, so that all can hear. And secondly, uh, uh, those who want to ask a question, my suggestion is if, you're, if your first sentence doesn't end in a question mark, uh, strive to see that your second does. <laughs> You've got time to compose your thoughts and uh, remember the value of conciseness. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Dr. Will, uh, George, um, this being higher ed, uh, we'll, give, we'll give precedence to process over substance. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I would like to ask a, a first question, uh, really about your, your craft. You met today very kindly with hundreds of our students, many of whom uh, want to become writers or journalists or other uh, similar, pursue other such professions. Um, what's your MO? You've generated by now somewhere in the mid four digits of columns, two a week for four and a half decades uh, in the Post Syndicate and what in the magazine formerly known as Newsweek. Um, how do you work? First, uh, let me begin by saying how good it is to be on a Midwestern campus. I'm a <laughs> faculty brat from the University of Illinois, where my father taught uh, philosophy. <clears throat> I, uh, I went from uh, Trinity College to Oxford, and then I, had to, I decided when I was leaving Oxford, I applied to Harvard Law School and Princeton in philosophy. I chose philosophy because Princeton was midway between two National League cities. <laughs> which gives you some measure of my academic seriousness. Uh, <clears throat> I did teach at Michigan State University. I'm making a tour of the Big Ten. And um, at the University of Toronto, before I turned to journalism, or as my father, the professor, said, before I sank to journalism. <laughs> it is about that that you ask. Uh, my method is uh, the most frequently asked question of a columnist is the one I asked my friend and colleague, <clears throat> Bill Buckley, when I started this, I said, Bill, how do you come up with things to write about? And he said, the world irritates me three times a week. <laughs> uh, I would modify that, say it irritates me, piques my curiosity, amuses me, something. I've never had a day in which I didn't have five topics I wanted to write about. In fact, I have in my wallet, I can actually <laughs> show it to you, I always carry a card with the coming topics I want to write about. And uh, there they are. It's uh, my next column that will go out tomorrow, and it'll be in Sunday. Thursday's paper is on the uh, 100th anniversary of the birth of Frank Sinatra, the great American songbook and all that. Uh, I think if I if I'm don't write a third of my columns, not only on subjects that are not above the fold on, in the New York Times, but on subjects that are not on the front page of the New York Times or even in the New York Times, I'm not doing my job right because you're neglecting, among other things, culture. And those of us who have sat at the feet of my 
former best friend Pat Moynihan know that culture drives politics and that politics can improve culture, but culture is primary and politics is in some sense an epiphenomenon. So my method of operating is to be open to the stimuli of this endlessly stimulating country and to understand that there's an awful lot more going on in the world than the Iowa caucuses. I, uh, I copied down a line from E.B. White, who likened what you do to uh, hunting, said sometimes writing, uh, sometimes uh, he sat in his blind waiting for something to come, uh, come along, and sometimes um, he uh, roamed the countryside hoping to scare something up. Maybe that's yeah. what you're doing tonight. That's I don't right. know. Um, I would like to ask you one other question about uh, um, journalism, in particular political journalism in our time. The uh, erosion, uh, maybe collapse of print journalism is something that uh, some, of, some of us uh, worry about, we worry that it will not be adequately replaced by 140, whatever it is, char uh, characters and yeah. so forth. Um, but maybe that's, uh, maybe that's just old fogeyism. I mean, uh, George, what, in terms of the public discourse of the country, and then in terms of self-governance, the, the necessary information of the public, are the new forms, and you're involved in some of them, electronic but also digital and so forth, uh, going to suffice to, to, uh, to in, inform a public to, that uh, is supposed to make its own wise decisions? Well, first, I, I do think <coughs> American newspapers are going to figure out how to monetize what they do mm -hmm. digitally. Uh, I think the reason Jeff Bezos who's worth, what, $50 million, billion or something. Mm -hmm. The reason he bought the Washington Post for $250 million, which was pocket change for him, uh, is he wants to solve the problem. He thinks it's an interesting challenge, and people like Bezos will solve that. I get up every morning at about 5 a.m., so I'm up when I hear this thwap on the concrete outside my house. That means some trees have been cut down in Canada, turned into paper, covered with ink, given to uh, an undocumented immigrant to deliver to my house. Uh, <clears throat> and I keep saying, how long can this keep going on? Mm -hmm. Particularly when I ask young people, as I did today in a class here at Purdue, how many of you read a hard copy of a newspaper and in a room of 100 students, maybe five hands went up. But that doesn't mean they're not reading. There's an enormous amount of writing going on, mm -hmm. but it's going on online. And I get up in the morning and I go fire up my tablet and I go to the ag what are called the aggregators. Real clear politics, real clear policy, real clear markets. And there's an enormous amount of tremendous talent out there writing for these. And I, th I, I don't know, but I have, uh, my column's in 450 some papers and I'll bet I have more readers online than I do in my papers. I may, I'm guessing but I think that's an educated guess. So I don't despair about the reading public continuing to read, whether they read words on former trees, I don't know, and I don't particularly care as long as they read. Uh, just a, a, an ancillary but related note, Black Friday weekend after Thanksgiving, for the first time in history, more Americans shopped online than shopped in stores. Now, the economy is going to have to adjust to that, and the journalistic economy is going to make a similar and, I think, a similarly successful adjustment. A common lament um, uh, these days has to do with the dysfunction of particularly the federal government. People come at that from different directions. Um, there's what I think of as the Friedman temptation. If, gee, if we could just beat China for a little while. Um, Not Milton people, Friedman, Tom Friedman. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. Important clarification, thank you. <laughs> and uh, we were discussing earlier uh, a scholar named Francis Fukuyama just 25 years ago was writing about the end of history, free institutions are triumphing everywhere, it's all inevitable, and, and uh, his latest book has to do with what he sees as the near fatal decay of, of our institutions, the vitocracy is his phrase for the way uh, Congress operates right now. Um, you remind our, your readers every so often that our, our 
Constitution wasn't really written for smooth, well-oiled efficiency. Mr. Madison had something different in mind. Have we, is this, maybe this is the system he contemplated or the sorts of outcomes, or have we really um, fallen to a, a state that we should worry about? This is what he had in mind with an important asterisk. When those 55 extraordinary people gathered in Philadelphia in the sweltering summer of 1787, they did not go there to devise an efficient government. The idea would have horrified them. They went to devise a government strong enough to secure our rights, but not too strong to threaten them. To which end, by the way, I said the most important word in the Declaration of Independence is secure. We hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and governments are instituted to secure those rights, pre-existing rights. Rights are not given to us by government, they're given to us by our nature, they're called natural rights, and the government exists to be secure them. So it is, in the language of the first two paragraphs of the Declaration, limited government is written in. It has the limited function of securing our rights, including facilitating our pursuit of happiness. So, in Philadelphia, they designed a government full of blocking mechanisms, three branches of government, two branches of the legislative branch, the Senate with its own constituencies and electoral rhythms, the House, different constituencies, different electoral rhythms, supermajorities, veto, veto overrides, judicial review, all kinds of ways of slowing the beast down and making things go slowly so people can have temperate judgments. George Washington famously defined the Senate as the saucer into which we pour our tea so that it will cool. And yet, I can think, I've been in Washington for 46 years, and not inconsiderable portion of the life of this republic, and I can think of nothing the American people have wanted intensely and protractedly that they didn't get. Sooner or later, the government delivers. Now, the asterisk over this, so, I've, so far I've said it's working the way Madison designed it. It's supposed to be slow, it's supposed to be difficult, get over it. The asterisk is this. Uh, Madison said in Federalist 45, the proposed Constitution, the Federalist papers, of course, were newspaper columns designed to get New York to ratify the Constitution. He said, the proposed Constitution delegates powers to the federal government that are few and specific. They envisioned a federal government that did not tell us what kind of light bulbs we were going to have, how much water could come through our shower heads. Both of these are recent government policies. The government was to do a few things and try to do them well. When you have a government that is into every form of national life, every nook and cranny, it begins to coagulate and you begin to get these veto groups. And then what you get is the government grows by the very negotiation of government. Someone says, well, there are no limits on what government does. I want it to do A, B, and C. And someone says, well, I want it to do uh, D, E, and F. So I'll support your three if you'll support my three. And the very process of, of bickering and brokering and negotiating inexorably makes the government bigger, which makes it all the more hard to move and all the easier to bring to a halt. So in that sense, it's Madison's basic framework, but without Madison's sense of limitation on government. Mm -hmm. If I could add one more thing, we've just reauthorized No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind was the sixth, I believe, iteration of the education Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. I mentioned this bit of ancient history because until about 1965, there was what was called a legitimacy barrier to Congress. Before Congress did something, it asked the question, where in the Constitution is the enumerated power that gives us the right to do this? James Q. Wilson, the smartest social scientist of his generation, said that that really ended in 1965, after the Goldwater landslide, anti-Goldwater landslide in 1964. I was one of the 27 million Goldwater voters, but never mind. <laughs> the Democrats had this enormous 
majority in Congress. They could do whatever they wanted. And they passed, among other things, the first Ed Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And James Q. Wilson said that was the end of the legitimacy barrier. If the government could casually intrude itself into the quintessentially state and local responsibility, there were no more limits on the purview of the federal government. And I think it was probably right. Well, pursuing the question of limits then, uh, you and many others have written um, uh, in the last few years with concern about, uh, out of concern that extra legal um, um, uh, executive actions were being taken, that things were being done by the executive branch of government that uh, did, had, did, had not uh, the delegated powers to do and that were the right and or were the rightful prerogative of the legislative branch. And, and you, however, unlike uh, many folks who would agree with you most of the time, have argued that it's the judiciary, um, in fact, the more activist judiciary, which should be stepping up to these issues where they arise. Could you say a word or two about that? Yes, conservatives, uh, alarmed by what they took to be the activism of the Warren Court in creating new rights, not enforcing traditional rights, adopted the language that there should be less judicial activism, a more deferential judiciary to the popularly elected branches, celebrating majority rule. Uh, in doing this, conservatives were doing the work of progressivism. It was the progressives who came along and said, well, the judiciary must proceed. We must allow the government to legislate and regulate where it will out of respect for majoritarianism. My view is that it is a dereliction of judicial duty not to enforce the boundaries of government, because if it doesn't, no one will. Uh, and to that end, uh, some of us, there's now a real growing movement among conservatives to say, we do not, the United States is not about majority rule. The United States is about liberty. And liberty can be threatened by majority rule. Our founder's catechism was roughly this. What is the worst outcome of politics? Tyranny. To what form of tyranny is democracy prey? Tyranny of the majority. Now, Madison's answer to this wasn't, first of all, judicial. It was a, a, a new sociology of democracy. He said, the Madisonian revolution in democratic theory was this. Hitherto, everyone who had said democracy was possible, and it was a few people who had said it, they said it is possible if, but only if, you have democracy in a small face-to-face -face society, Rousseau's Geneva, Pericles Athens, because the larger the society, the more factions you will have, and factions were thought to be the enemy of democracy. Madison turned that on its head, saying the way you will prevent majority tyranny is to don't have majorities, by which he meant don't have stable tyrannical majorities. Hence, he said famously in Federalist 10, have an extensive republic, not a small republic, an extensive republic. The larger the republic, the more factions you will have. And he said in Federalist 51, the first job of government is to protect the different and unequal capacities of acquiring property, because those would generate different factions. And you would have this maelstrom of factions forming temporary, unstable majorities that would not be durable enough to be tyrannical. And that is roughly the interest group liberalism that we have in this country. Now it gets out of hand, particularly when the government doesn't recognize Madisonian limits on its proper scope and actual competence. But beyond that, it's, again, Madison's great contribution to world democratic theory. The uh, expansion of government, and in particular, the unilateral executive actions, and many of we've seen lately, though, are generally presented as uh, defending the defenseless or uh, the powerless. Well, when presidents say they're going to go around the Constitution to defend the powerless, they're defending a constituency of one, the presidency. <laughs> uh, all presidents do it. This president has done it with uh, more enthusiasm and brio and gusto and... Uh, <laughs> lack of conscience than most. Uh, I mean, the idea that one, one of surely the most important international agreements of the post-war, post-Second World War era is our agreement with Iran, which should have been a treaty. 
he doesn't like Congress, so he doesn't submit it to Congress. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, more about him We'll later. come back to him. Yes. Uh, <laughs> also known as the root of all evil. Uh, <laughs> Woodrow Wilson said, a president can be as big as he wants to be. And that's true, because unless you have in a president the self-restraint that is dictated by the ethics of our Constitution to respect the separation of powers. Woodrow Wilson was not just the first PhD to be president, there's a warning in this. He was, <laughs> I speak as a PhD from Princeton, Wilson's Princeton. Woodrow Wilson was not just the first president of the American Political Science Association to be uh, president. But he was, not coincidentally, the first American president to criticize the American founding, which he did not do peripherally. He did root and branch. He said the heart of the problem is the essence of the American Constitution, the separation of powers. He said at one point that was fine when we had to worry about majority tyranny. But now, he said, in the early 20th century, we are so enlightened and so united as a people that we don't need to worry about that. And what we need to do is unleash the government to do the wonderful things it can do. He said, our Constitution was written, and this is right, at a time when there were four million free Americans, 80% of whom lived within 20 miles of Atlantic tidewater. Now, he said, we're a continental nation united by steel rails and copper wires and all the rest, and we need a government with powers commensurate to its great responsibilities. Therefore, he said, the Constitution bequeathed by the founders is fundamentally wrong because it divides, it has separation of powers and rivalrous branches of government that make it difficult to move. Well, if you believe that, then you believe that presidents should do what this president has done and Richard Nixon did also with certain gusto, and that is ignore the separation of powers, ignore the uh, uh, Congress, and here's where I come back to your question about an activist judiciary. Congress is so busy, there are only 535 members. So there have been 535 members for about 80 years. The business of government has increased a hundredfold in those years. The same number of people spread thinner and thinner and thinner. So what they do is they don't really pass laws anymore, they pass sentiments. They say we should have uh, an adequate education. We should have maximum participation. And then they shove it off to the bureaucracy to really write the laws. Well, there used to be something called the non-delegation doctrine, whereby the Supreme Court, before it gave up enforcing this, said, in John Locke's words in the second treatise on government, legislatures may make laws, they may not make other legislatures. What we're doing now is turning over the real writing of laws to executive agencies, and it's up to the government. Clarence Thomas is extremely good on this, saying it's now time for the Supreme Court to say to the Congress, if you can't write laws on your own, if you're too busy, then just leave the subject alone, because you cannot delegate an essentially legislative function. That's an example of what uh, some of us on the right say the, you know, we need a much more engaged judiciary to do. Um, it's time for those with the temerity to do so to come forward and approach one of the mics. I've got another question or two, which will give you time to do that, but uh, if we can get at least a couple in each one. I do, I do want to ask you um, um, about a, a foreign policy question. Um, you have parted company, at least as I read you, on more than one occasion with people, uh, again, uh, uh, who, would, who would otherwise off, most often agree with you in cautioning against uh, hubris or overreach on the part of the United States in foreign policy. You were uh, very um, cautionary about Libya. You were cautionary about Syria. Those are, there were, I can go back further for other examples, but um, do you feel, just take those two examples, do you uh, still feel as you did, uh, have, have, would you uh, 
uh, write those columns any different in view of events since you did? Since no, you I wouldn't, and I'd be in with the third example. The worst mistake I've made in 40-some years as a columnist <clears throat> was not opposing the Iraq War, which I think one of the reasons why I think that is far and away the worst blunder in American foreign policy history is that I think we've paid about 20% of the price we're going to pay for that pandemic destabilization of a region. Uh, I got off that fairly quickly. I mean, by except I, I, I'll tell you a little story. I was at a dinner party with Don Rumsfeld, who's a good friend, in June of 2003, three months into the invasion. And I said, I'll bet you'll be awfully glad when you find those weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> and he turned to me and he said, what's the difference? And I said, oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, good men. Colin Powell and others read the intelligence, the French read the intelligence, the British, the Chinese, they all believed those weapons were there. They were wrong, and that was a lesson to me about how hard it is to know things in this world, how hard it is to be sure. Along came Libya. Libya appealed, I'm convinced, to the Obama administration because it was untainted by national interest. It was completely pure humanitarian intervention. Uh, the British felt the same way. That this was, we were going to save the people of Benghazi and others from Gaddafi. Well, my goodness. Not only was it illegal, because the president didn't even, I mean, completely ignored the war powers resolution, <clears throat> but we, we, for eight months, it was probably the longest, most protracted assassination in history, as we tried to chase down Gaddafi with fighter bombers. Again, for no discernible American interest. And they never asked Admiral Yamamoto's question. Admiral Yamamoto was the genius who, what day is today? It's the day. Pearl Harbor, OK. To, um, this is Pearl Harbor Day. This is really opposite. He was the man who conducted the brilliant attack on Pearl Harbor. About eight months before which, the Japanese government summoned him and said, could you take a fleet across the North Pacific stealthily and deliver a devastating blow against the American fleet in Hawaii? Yamamoto said, I can do that if you'll design some, some shallow running torpedoes for the Pearl Harbor. I, I can do that. He said, and then I will run wild in the Pacific for six months, maybe a year. But then what? Mm -hmm. Admiral Yamamoto had studied at Harvard. He loved our country. Amazingly, he loved our country even after studying at Harvard. Uh, <laughs> he'd, been, he'd been military attaché at, at the Japanese embassy in Washington. He knew our country. He knew that what they would achieve at Pearl Harbor was that they would arouse a continental industrial superpower and that Japan's defeat would be implicit in its initial great victory. We never asked the question when we went into Iraq, but then what? I once said, Iraq needs only four things to succeed. I said this in, in a talk I gave that was not well received. Um, five months after the invasion, I said, they need a James Madison, that is someone who can devise the uh, our constitutional architecture for a society with factions. They need an Alexander Hamilton who can conjure out of dust a, uh, a, 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 a economic strength. They need a George Washington, a unifying figure above politics to unite the country. And they need a John Marshall who can construe the works of these other men. And I said they need a fourth thing. They need the extraordinary social soil from which those four geniuses emerged in the young America. Well, there's no such social soil in the Middle East, least of all in Iraq. So what I was saying is all they need are five things, but those are enormous five things, and they don't have any of the five. But, but just remember, always ask Yamamoto's question, uh -huh. but then what? I think we have a question here. Welcome to Indiana. Thank you. Uh, briefly, you touched on the Founding Fathers and their uh, construction of the Constitution and the checks and balances. 
And one of the things that they put in there in order to get the uh, states to pass it was another check and balance against what you mentioned, the tyranny of the government, and that was the Article 5 Constitution of the states. Can you briefly touch on, there is a fledgling movement for that now. There is, a, there is a movement now. Under Article 5, you can call a constitutional convention. There are two problems with this. One, who's going to play Madison? In those four million people in the end of the 18th century, we produced Madison, George Mason, Hamilton, Franklin, my goodness. We got 320 million Americans. I don't think we could find one of them at this point. <laughs> but beyond that, you may remember we got the Constitution we got because the Annapolis Convention said, let's go to Philadelphia and revise the Articles of Confederation. That's all they said. Well, they got to Philadelphia, tore up the Articles of Confederation. I'm glad they did. But the cautionary tale is you can start your Article 5 convention, but how do you keep it from being a runaway convention? Now, there are some very clever lawyers involved in this who said you can word the call of the convention so that, for example, and this is what they're trying to do, they would be allowed to meet for one day, they'd be allowed to vote on one thing, a balanced budget amendment, for example, and then they would, by that act, they would be dispersed. It sounds too clever by half to me, but let's, let's assume you could do it. That is what, it, what the gentleman's talking about. There's a movement afoot to do it, and it terrifies me. <laughs> thank you. Over here. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, as uh, uh, money has moved more and more into politics, to, I mean, it's disheartening. Uh, it, it seems that gerrymandering and, and then lately Citizens United have quashed this maelstrom of differential ideas that uh, were supposed to be a wash in. And as these factional groups have gained more and more money, what's, how, how is the average or common citizen to, to, you know, with their single vote supposed to stand up to this? this but that's a good question, and I'm sure you speak for many here, and I'm going to make you annoy you seriously with my answer. <clears throat> I think, A, there's far too little money in politics, and B, I'm amazed at how little money there is in politics. People say, gosh, there's too much money in politics. 85 to 90 percent of the money in politics is used to disseminate political advocacy, political speech. So people who are saying, there's too much money in politics are saying two things. They know the right amount of money in politics, and therefore they know the right amount of political speech that ought to be disseminated. I don't believe either. People say, gosh, this year, last year, each presidential candidacy in the two-year cycle spent a billion dollars. It's $2 billion in 2012. Every year, Americans spend $2 billion on Easter candy. This is a rich country. <laughs> we just spent in October $6.7 billion on Halloween candy costumes and decorations. Spend $2 billion to elect presidents who oversee a $3.8 trillion budget? It's amazing how little we spend electing the lawmakers who make these decisions. In fact, I mean, any economist looking at this would say there's a disproportion here. What the economist would note is that we spend far more on lobbying because it's much more efficient. In politics, and there's abundant social science demonstrating this, money does not draw the convictions of politicians to it. Money flows toward politicians of particular convictions. The NRA supports Republicans because Republicans support the Second Amendment. It's not the other way around. The NRA isn't bribing people to support the Second Amendment. They're out there. Uh, the teachers' unions support Democrats uh, because they're not bribing Democrats. Democrats believe what the teachers' unions are doing. And, and that's politics. And I don't, I'm not ready to charge bad faith on either part of that transaction. You cannot regulate the quantity, content, and timing of political speech, which McCain-Feingold did all three, without limiting free speech, without violating the First Amendment. And I would point out to you, 
with regard to Citizens United, all Citizens United did was it said, when Americans band together in corporate form, they do not forfeit their First Amendment rights. The corporations and unions, the corporations and unions that are protected by the Citizens United decision are not Microsoft and Pepsi-Cola. They don't get involved in politics. They don't know how to offend anybody. The corporations that are, that are freed up now to spend money are the Sierra Club, the National Rifle Association, the National Right to Life Committee, the National Abortion Rights Action League, the advocacy groups that are all corporations, every one of them. Those are the ones that benefited from this, and I think we benefited from it by increasing the number of people, which you're rightly concerned about, whose voices will be involved in and heard in our politics. So I think the um, most alarming development in the last uh, two years in Washington is that 54 Democratic senators voted to amend the First Amendment. They voted to change the Bill of Rights to make it less protective. Never happened in American history before. They voted to amend the First Amendment to empower Congress to regulate the quantity, content, and timing of political speech about Congress. Now, that just strikes me as dangerous. Thank you for a really important question, and if, if someone hadn't asked it, I would have. Thank you very, very much. Over here. All right, Mr. Uh, Dr. Will, um, about 50 or so years ago, we had these great, I guess, side-by-side -side debates of Gore Vidal, William F. Buckley. If I had to ask you right now, I guess off the top of your head, what left-leaning political thinkers or commentators do you most like to read and admire and why? That's a good question. I just the other night saw the movie, Best of Enemies. I don't know if, how many of you have seen it. It's about the Buckley-Vidal debate. And I have to tell you, Bill was, for the rest of his life, uh, chagrined at uh, participating in that. He thought it got out of hand, and it was the harbinger of the kind of rage culture that we now have and too much of, in my judgment, on radio and on television. Who would I like to, I, I, when I was with ABC, I appeared periodically with Paul Krugman, which is an affliction sent to make us more spiritual. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Paul, is, Paul is smart and, uh, um, you know, he's informed and, and all that. The problem is he doesn't think you can disagree with him honestly, that you're, you're either a fool or a knave or a knavish fool. Uh, so it's hard to debate. Uh, uh, that's, that's a good question. There, there's a guy named Michael Kinsley who's been around for many years, uh, a man of the left used to edit the New Republic, uh, very smart and witty. Uh, he's the one who gave us Kinsley's definition of a political gaffe is an untimely expression of the truth. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'd say Michael Kinsley. That'd be a good match. I'd, I'd buy a ticket. Good evening, Dr. Will. My name is Mitch McCord. My question for you is regarding the front page cover stories. Do you find yourself writing differently when writing for the front page of a paper compared to when on the inside? I never write for the front page. Oh. I've, I've always been a columnist. Uh, so so I, I don't have to, have to worry about that. Um, I, was, I was amused the other day that the New York Times so excited was it about the problem of gun control, they said for the second time we're going to have an editorial on the front page. And I thought, New York Times editorializes on the front page every day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The first, the first time they did, by the way, was June 1920, when they were so appalled by the Republicans nominating Governor Harding of Ohio for president. And the country took the Times so seriously, they gave Harding 60% of the popular vote, which was, to that point, the biggest landslide in American history. Uh, yeah. It seems that the media, whether it's in politics or entertainment or sports, are enamored by the people they're covering. You've written in all areas. You have friends, I'm sure, in all those areas. What do you consider an appropriate distance between 
those people in those three areas that that's you a, write that's about? A, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not one who thinks the media ought to have a dogmatic adversarial position to the political class. The vast majority of men and women in politics are trying to do difficult things under difficult circumstances, and they're trying to do their best. And it's, it's important to know them and un understand them. Uh, my wife, who was, uh, has worked for Bob Dole over and over again, she holds world's record for most concession statements ever written. <laughs> uh, and she was, she was Ronald Reagan's last White House Director of Communications, so she's been around this business. She and I have uh, regularly have dinner parties, small, 12 people. Barack Obama came to one of them when it was a week before he was elected, uh, not inaugurated. We've had all the Republican candidates, almost all of them this year, because we think it's important to do this, to see people in a social setting You're in, and understand they're human beings. And, uh, uh, so I, I don't advocate sort of hostility. Now, you can, you can go too far. I did so once when, uh, in 1980, when Reagan was preparing for his one debate with Jimmy Carter. Uh, I helped prepare him for the debate. It was not at that point a state secret that I was for Reagan. But uh, I still shouldn't have done that. But uh, so you have to draw a line, and there is one, and I stepped over it. Haven't done that since. But uh, I, th I think it's important to see people. Tomorrow night in Washington, I'm going to, uh, my house is being used for a book party for Virginia Coates, who's uh, written a book called uh, 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 David Sling. It's on uh, ten, understanding democracy through 10 works of art. She's an art historian. She also is the chief foreign policy advisor to Ted Cruz, who will be at my house tomorrow night. Uh, Nothing wrong with that. That's, you know, that, there'll be a lot of folks there. And, and we, we just treat these people as not as constant adversaries. Not, they're not enemies. That's a great question, too. Thank yeah. you very much. <clears throat> Hello. I read a book recently that was called The Shallows. And in The Shallows, uh, the author argued that people are reading more than they ever have, but they comprehend less of it due to the tendency to skim online articles. And your point earlier about the switch to online reading really yeah. interests me. And just asking about your writing, have you noticed like people respond differently to your articles or tend to misinterpret what you say? And do you feel like new journalists today have to kind of like adapt their writing style in order to appeal to the new audience? That's a, that's a question that really gets close to the bone to me because I have to treat every subject in the universe in 750 words which means I have to be concise and compress things, which means I have to use a kind of more complicated syntax than you're used to in the normal wire service story that begins explaining who, what, when, where, why. Also, there's nothing in the world more optional than reading a syndicated column. So if <laughs> Americans, Americans are plied and belabored by Tens of thousands, I'm not exact, tens of thousands of messages a day. You drive down the street, the signage is bombarding you. You turn on the television or the radio, the commercials are bombarding you. You turn on the internet, the spam is bombarding you. People who get this, so Americans develop these filters. It's a survival device in which we turn it all into sort of audible wallpaper, there but not noticed. But in order for me to get people to read my column, I think it has to be written with a kind of flair and energy and elegance, if you will. I don't always achieve it, but I try. Uh, and I do find, getting to the point of your question, that some people will say, I couldn't follow that sentence. And I'm sorry, it had a subject, object, a predicate. It was a perfectly <laughs> serviceable sentence. But it didn't read like green eggs and ham. <laughs> And, and I, I do think people are having more and more trouble following. I mean, they would have trouble reading Dickens. They would have trouble reading P.G. Woodhouse, from which I got my style. Uh, they would have trouble reading Middlemarch, because the Victorian, there was a kind of Victorian fullness in their syntax. And it, it worries me. There's a lot of research already, and I've been 
egging some of our people here to look more deeply at what might be happening happening to the cognitive yes. power and the attention spans and things like this. I think that the, uh, of, of particularly young people who have only known one environment, the, the, the bombardment you just talked about, and the, uh, sooner or later we'll know, but preferably sooner. One over here. I did wear my Purdue gear for you today. Um, I like to talk about politics and sports. Um, Bob Costas comes to mind and highly irritates me, so I turned on the TV. <laughs> um, but what do you think about the injection of so much political um, talk into sports or, or veering to the left in sports journalism? It's real. Someone has said that ESPN has become N MSNBC with athletes. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, it, it, sports writers like the occasion to get to sort of, you know, get out of the dugout and out of the clubhouse and into the larger arena. Of, so when something comes up like domestic abuse, which is a serious problem, particularly in uh, in the NFL, they sometimes go overboard on it. First, uh, openly gay football player. Mr. Sam, I guess he was, from the University of Missouri. They, I think they do tend to go overboard. And it's uh, <clears throat> MSNB, or ESPN does seem to dwell on race more than is absolutely necessary. But uh, it's understandable, and at the end of the day, that's not why we watch ESPN, and ESPN has lost a whole bunch of subscribers in, in, uh, mm -hmm. recently, and I think that's one of the reasons why. I mean, for, Sports is an escape from reality in some ways. It doesn't mean a damn thing. That's why we like it. <laughs> uh, that's why I wrote a book on baseball called Men at Work. <laughs> now it's, it's, they're not boys of summer and they're not playing. It's a dangerous, demanding business they're doing. And uh, it's enough. I read, it, 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 it was consciously anti-romantic sports writing. I didn't, I'm, I'm tired of people saying, baseball reminds me of the universe or the Federal Reserve Board or something. It's enough, it's nice, it's baseball. My dad read your book. <laughs> Thank you. I published Thank you. 14 books and that one's probably sold more than the other 13 combined. <laughs> A few weeks ago, American Academe was scarred by the shameful capitulation of the University of Missouri and Princeton University to the petulant extortion of group identity politics advocates. Don't you think it's time for American universities to reject group identity diversity politics and focus more on promoting academic freedom by empowering individual students to reach their God-given potential? In a word, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, universities have uh, talked so long now about identity politics that we are our race, we are our gender, we are our sexual preference, that we are our identity is tied up with group identities. And they're beginning to reap a kind of whirlwind from this, that uh, we've developed all kinds of grievance groups an exquisite sensitivity to slights real and imagined. That's why they're called microaggressions. I should have preceded this answer with a trigger warning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it's dangerous because universities are the probably the finest flower of Western civilization, and it took us a long time to get here. And these are fragile institutions that depend on vast tolerance for surprise and offense and shock and unsettling. That's what we're here for. All of those things, they're not the, all those things that are now being called bad things are what we pay good money to accomplish here. I mean, the idea that a university should be a safe space, safe from what? I recently saw my son as a Northwestern graduate and a former Marine. It's a, 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 a Robert Kappa picture taken on D-Day from inside a uh, LST. It's the uh, American soldiers jumping into the water off Omaha Beach. 
and over it, it said, college age men leaving their safe space. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, I, uh, when I was at Oxford, a friend of mine named Vernon Bagdenor, this was at a time when the University of Oxford had gone out of its way to offend Margaret Thatcher, which is really not smart. <laughs> um, they always gave an honorary degree to the prime minister. They decided not to give one to her, and she knew what to do about that. And uh, he walked out on the balcony of Brazenose College, which faces Radcliffe Camera, the circular library there. And he said, as though musing aloud, he said, the be most beautiful view in the south of England, therefore the most beautiful view in Europe, therefore the most beautiful view in the world. And yet, he said, there was a time when everyone wanted to attend the University of Padua. No one wants to go to the University of Padua today. And he said, there could be a time when people will not want to attend the University of Oxford. All these institutions are fragile because they are based on intangible things, certain attitudes of tolerance and acceptance and the thrill of verbal combat and the willingness to give offense and to overturn settled assumptions. You get rid of that, the, the institution dies, it just dies. Who wants to go to the University of Padua? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> the Bill of Rights, uh, most of them, they start with Congress shall not. But um, I believe it was in 1925, the Supreme Court, I believe they used the 14th Amendment to apply the Bill of Rights to uh, states and localities. I was wondering what your opinion is of that uh, decision and uh, the, its ramifications. I'm for it. I'm, I'm for what's called the incorporation of the Bill of Rights to apply to the states. I think it was really done by the 14th Amendment which says in there that the, uh, no Americans shall be desired, denied their privileges or immunities of Americans. Now, what does that mean? Unfortunately, in the slaughterhouse cases of 1873, I won't go into the details, but the Supreme Court gave a very narrow reading to privileges or immunities. I think privileges or immunity means all the rights of Americans, including the unenumerated rights of the Tenth Amendment. My son is in second year law student, and I've told him his life's work is to relitigate the slaughterhouse cases <laughs> of 1873. Um, the, I've given you the answer to your very good question, which is I'm all for saying that Americans are not Virginians. We're not, you know, Robert E. Lee referred to Virginia as my country. A lot of people did then. We fought the Civil War to go from the United States are to the United States is. And these are American rights and belong uh, to be protected by the 14th Amendment everywhere. We've somehow developed a lopsided tendency to the right side of the stage. Right? <laughs> so, yes, ma'am, please. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate your uh, thoughtful commentary uh, so far. I have a question, but I do have a statement to precede it, and I'll try to end the second one with a question mark. Well, I'm already behind, because I already said a sentence saying it with a period. Um, You're good. We'll start the clock over. <laughs> Depends on how many semicolons. <laughs> They're coming. Um, I suppose I was motivated to stand about the question about the University of Missouri. And I, I um, feel very strongly that when black students are responding to the N-word smeared in feces on a wall, it is not a question of tolerance or exchange. It's actually the, a very hostile environment that they're trying to encounter. And the request or expectation that they, that there will be professors um, who are, uh, uh, who, who look like them in color or who are female um, is also not uh, an unreasonable expectation. And I suppose that I would like really a thoughtful engagement with that because that's not a microaggression, that's really a systematic, it's path dependent, right? So that if women could not enter universities, then how could they possibly be a majority of professors or even half of them as a country, you know, by, uh, 
by chance we would expect. So, so I'd like a response to that, but my actual question is about John Boehner, right? Um, and I wondered, <laughs> Um, I think that resigning is like the new thing to do. So that's actually what I think happened at Mizzou. I think that resignation is noble now since uh, John Boehner. Um, and I wonder what you think about the Freedom Caucus and their pushing him out of leadership of the Republican Party or whether there's some other um, explanation for kind of the, it seemed to me that he fell on his sword. Um, as, as a speaker well, he, of the House. He, he could not manage the caucus anymore, and he got tired of trying. And there's a, a mechanism for calling for the vacating of the speakership, and John Boehner didn't want to go through that anymore. And uh, I, if I were in Congress, uh, I'd probably be a member of the Freedom Caucus. I'm a Tea Party guy in good standing. Uh, I mean, I, all they're saying is read the Constitution and do what Madison said. Got two Princetonians sitting here. Madison from the great class of 1771 uh, is, uh, is our guy. Uh, so I think Boehner got tired. And I think uh, he felt someone else might manage this better. And, you know, Bismarck once said, God looks after drunks babies in the United States. <laughs> Uh, he must have been looking after us to have someone of Paul Ryan's caliber standing there uh, who will see what he can do. Uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to say about the University of Missouri other than this. <clears throat> Obviously, feces, what was it, a swastika or something? Mm -hmm. that's, that's intolerable. It should be, the culprit should be found and they should be at least expelled. Uh, yes, we want... Uh, Lots of women in academe. I think, I don't know how it is in uh, PhD programs around the country. There are more women in law school now, I believe, than men. More women, I think, in uh, medical school than men right now. 58% of all undergraduates. Yeah, 50. So, I mean, that's, that, demography is going to take care of that. What we want, however, 100 years from now is not to give a damn about who looks like whom. Mm -hmm. uh, When my dear friend Pat Moynihan was Richard Nixon's chief domestic policy advisor, and he had a big staff, and Nixon once said to him, uh, Pat, uh, 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 what uh, uh, portion of your staff are women? Pat drew himself up to his full and considerable six foot five and said, Mr. President, the 1964 Civil Rights Act forbids me to ask my staff if they're men or women. <laughs> That's kind of America I want to live in. So we got one more and just time for one, because I'm saving one. You are? Okay. I've come to believe that the mainstream media, uh, journalism, has become so biased and so slanted, so agenda-driven, that it is no longer trustworthy. Am I off base? You're not off base in the way we've gone back to the past. There was a time uh, at about in the 1790s when politics was at least as violently bitter as it is today. And our party system, which none of the founders anticipated, was coalescing. Uh, all the newspapers were party newspapers. Jefferson had his favorite newspaper as Secretary of State. He kept it alive with government business. Uh, the Federalists did the same thing. Uh, so in a sense, we've, we're reverting mm -hmm. to something, that the period of scrupulous, objective, independent, observing journalism may have been a little episode. I don't know. But uh, the journalism today is, uh, the internet is part of it, and cable television, which broke up the oligopoly of the three networks. 30 years ago, at the dinner hour in America, 80% of all the television sets in use were tuned to ABC, NBC, and CBS. Now it's way below 50, and that's healthy. Break it up, you know, let people, let the MSNBC people go there and the CNN people, both of them, go there. And, uh, <laughs> and the Fox News people, bless them, come to us. And, you know, <laughs> the, you know let a thousand flowers bloom. It'll, it'll sort itself out. But, 
it's healthy that people have now said, we have to look at this differently. We have to look at this. There are party newspapers. They just are. Uh, and uh, if people know that going in, they, they'll sort it out. The American people are not dopes. They know how to read newspapers and how to watch television. It makes them irritable, but uh, <laughs> they know how to do it. It's only in the last 10 years, in fact, one of them lives on in name at least, that in this state, the, the two uh, institutions of the Indiana Democratic Editorial Association and the Indiana Republican Editorial yeah. Association finally gave up the ghosts and disappeared. But they were the vestiges of that era of party uh, yeah. uh, voice yeah. uh, newspapers and, yeah. and lived right on into the oh, 80s at yeah. least. So, um, so uh, I'll... Uh, I want to close, uh, I want to elevate the debate to something even more important than those wonderful questions, and that, of course, is baseball. <laughs> and uh, so I, I really, this is a question that um, I've only thought about in the hypothetical till the last year or two when the Cubs began to uh, rise. And George, my question is, I know you've waited through those hundred and whatever it is, seven consecutive rebuilding seasons that you always write about. <laughs> But um, I'm worried now, um, and, and I was interested, you used this same word a minute ago in some sports context, but if the Cubs perish the thought, actually break through and win the World Series, won't it end one of the great romances in all of American sports? Won't it spoil this, for this great uh, uh, yearning for all time? I hope to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I only write about politics to support my baseball habit, which is, <laughs> which is so severe that my wedding ring, which I designed myself, has the Major League Baseball logo on it. <laughs> it's my way of telling Mari that in my heart she ranks up there close to baseball, which is <laughs> call me romantic. Um, losing is good for your character, I'm told. I've got quite enough character, thank you. I'm done with that. Uh, look, I grew up in Champaign, Illinois, midway between Chicago and St. Louis. Mm. At an age too tender to make life-shaping decisions, I had to choose between being a Cub fan <laughs> and a Cardinal fan. All my friends became Cardinal fans and grew up cheerful and liberal. <laughs> uh, I became a dyspeptic conservative. So you've suffered enough, huh? I have suffered enough. <laughs> Dodger fan that I am, I, I was uh, got to spend some time with Tommy Lasorda once, and he too said, he said his wife Jo had once said to him, as he left on yet another tr scouting trip or something, Tommy, there are times I think you love baseball more than you love me. And he said, Jo, I do, but I love you more than football. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, uh, we've done some, I had some research com commission, and uh, uh, Princeton's, uh, uh, some of Princeton's finest uh, minds have determined that of those 324 million Americans you mentioned, exactly 17 men look good in a bow tie, and you were one of them. Very good. So here's a Purdue bow tie for your next to the television. Thank you. Thank you. And as we break, I just I want every, everybody who doesn't already know to know that uh, Dr. Will gave us not just this tremendous hour, but several other hours meeting with uh, uh, two classes, hundreds of our kids, a reception with some of our honors college students. Uh, he uh, really, uh, we, we probably imposed on him uh, too much and, uh, uh, today, but uh, I want to thank you on behalf of the Purdue community, George, not only for today, but for a remarkable lifetime of helping uh, all who were uh, attentive, uh, presidents, uh, senators, and most importantly, citizens, uh, to think more carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much.